Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been uh, over seven years since the last time I was here. It was a lot different. The show was uh, not even half the size. This thing has grown immensely. Some of the biggest shows I've been to. Um, if we could do me a favor and turn the house lights up a little bit so I could see the audience as well as they can see me, I would appreciate it. Also, I don't have a moderator. I'll be speaking to you directly and answering any questions that you might have if you'll step over to that microphone. And the quicker you get over there, the quicker we can get this started. So if anybody has any questions, now's the time to come across and ask me. This is perfect. Thank you for the lights. Uh, I can tell you, since no one's standing up over there, that uh, Battlestar Galactica, to me, was the best usage of television I've ever been a part of in my life. And it was an honor and privilege to be on that show. I was able to, uh, to start my career doing Blade Runner. Anybody seen Blade Runner? Yeah. Blade Runner to me was probably uh, one of the most extraordinary experiences. When it came out, we did it uh, back in 1980, 81, we were shooting it. And I think it came out in about 1982. And it cost $40 million. And then that time, it was probably one of the most expensive films ever made. And uh, of course, when it came out, it was a bomb. It was very well received here in England and in Europe, but in the United States it was not received very well at all. And I think it had to do a lot with uh, what was going on with Harrison Ford at the time. Harrison Ford at that time had just finished doing the three largest films ever made in the history of film. He had done Star Wars, he had done Raiders of Lost Ark, and then he had done uh, the second Star Wars. So he was an action hero. And when he went into his fourth film, which was Blade Runner, uh, where he got his ass kicked every time he talked to anybody, <laughs> I think his, his uh, uh, fan base couldn't take that kind of character, so they kind of didn't want to see him do it. Now, it's become one of his best films, thank the Lord. Question number one, thank you for joining in. What You're is very it? welcome. Um, and I have two questions. Okay. I'm a massive ESG fan. So what I'd like to know is, first of all, what is your favorite BSG moment? And secondly, were you happy with the ending of BSG? <laughs> I was very, very, very sad with the ending of BSG. I'll start from there. Um, a lot of people, you know, were, didn't want the show to end. So that, like most of us, so any ending would not have been satisfying for anybody. I do tell you one thing. How many of you have seen the entire program from beginning to end? Okay, okay. I should say, how many have not seen <laughs> Battlestar Galactica? Why hear that? How many have not seen Battlestar Galactica? Be honest, raise your hand. So there's a few of us. You've come to the wrong show. <laughs> because it's such a spoiler. I mean, I don't know what you're doing in the audience. I don't know if you know anything about watching episode of television, but once you know the ending, <laughs> why do you watch the thing? Don't worry, don't worry about those people, okay. Um, the ending, if you were to get to, if whenever you see Battlestar Galactica again, I want you to do yourself a favor. Have Blade Runner with you. <laughs> and when you see the entire show from beginning to end, you're going to get to the very last so you're going to get to the very last moment where Baltar and, and Six are walking down Times Square in 2008. And Six turns to Baltar and says, this has happened before, it's going to happen again. And Baltar says, no, I think this time humanity has learned its lesson. And they turn around and walk into down uh, uh, Times Square. As soon as it goes to black, put in Blade Runner. <laughs> in the year of 2019, you're going to get your mind blown. <laughs> because you're going to see me there. Not me, but my genetic structure of Gap. 
And you can see that it's 2019. It's only like nine years or 10 years, 11 years after we, we ended Battlestar when that takes place and you see what happens to our Cylons. They now become replicants and they're even more intense than they were before. So that's one. And to tell you uh, the most memorable moment in, God, this, depending on what you call memorable, okay? Because there were some moments in, in, in Battlestar where I just like completely lost it and I thought it was hysterical and very funny. And then there were moments where they were so tender and so ridiculously emotional that you couldn't, I couldn't forget them if I tried. Uh, the most memorable, I think, is probably when I turn around and I look at uh, Rosalind and I see that she's passed when she dies. And because I'm, I'm looking out, I'm talking to her about the Vista and I turn to her and I look at her and she's passed. I never got to say goodbye, and I never got to say, uh, I love you, and I never got to, you know, so I put my ring on her finger, and as I went down to kiss her hand, a teardrop falls right on her hand. And uh, we had to do that scene three times, because when that happened, Mary, playing Rosalind, lost it. <laughs> She's supposed to be dead, and she starts to cry. So it was very difficult to do that scene. And at the end of the scene, when it was over, that was the very last shot that we did together. It was the very last scene. It was 3 o'clock in the morning inside the Raptor. And um, when she stood up and walked out of the Raptor, and it was called the Raptor, I mean her, it was over. She collapsed. And her son grabbed her as she was coming out of the Raptor, and she collapsed into his arms. It was very emotional and very strong. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But, uh, that's one of the experiences I remember the most. Also, the, uh, do you remember when I break <laughs> the ship? <laughs> that was a big, that was a big one. Uh, most of you don't know what I'm talking about, but there was a moment in time when uh, Starbuck dies, and uh, I learned that she's dead, and I'm working on my model that I was always working on. And uh, right at that moment, they tell me that she's killed and I crush and destroy the model. Well, they didn't tell me that it was a rare antique. <laughs> I turned to them and I said, what the hell did you put it in the scene for? Are you kidding me? Come on, give me a break. I mean, I'm learning that <laughs> one of my closest and dearest loves of my life as my daughter uh, had just been killed and you have this thing in front of me and you don't expect me like to go nuts. So anyway, that was a real disaster. <laughs> I very memorable. Question, go ahead. Thank you. I'm a huge uh, Battlestar Galactica fan too, so thanks for that series, it's, it's wonderful. Um, what's your take on why so much sci-fi uh, views the future so negatively? It's going to be robots that kill us, it's, um, uh, zombies uh, because of uh, a cancer drug going wrong, it's uh, an asteroid. Why does so much sci-fi have such a negative view of the future? Well, obviously, either you're not living it right now, <laughs> so you're not taking notes, <laughs> but I think technology is coming. It, it's going singularity is near, and um, I think that uh, a lot of the negativity that we feel are things that we really appreciate and enjoy, or else we wouldn't watch them. It's like, I did Dexter, uh, the sixth season. Anybody see that? <laughs> you guys are sick. <laughs> you guys are the sickest people I know. There's a program for you, all right? You want a program of negativity? <laughs> I tell you, if it wasn't for the fact that I was never there, Spoiler, I was never there. I had been dead four and a half years before the period starts that I'm supposed to be there. I'm stuck in a refrigerator, cooler, but you don't find that out until the end. But uh, I could not have done that show. That show was the weirdest show I've ever been around in my life. I mean, can you imagine every day you get up and you go in front of the, and you go on to the set and there's Michael Hall, Dexter walking around, and Dexter is being Dexter 
all the time. I mean, he's never like Michael Hall. Hi, how are you? Is <laughs> <laughs> he's always just inside of his character. It was creepy. Like, it was very creepy. And the more he got into it, the creepier he got. So I was on the sixth uh, six season, so he was already nuts. <laughs> and I, I feel, notice that you haven't seen him around lately. Question, go ahead. Hi, I'm a big ESG fan and also Shield. Um, as you did the remake of ESG, if you could do any show as a remake and be in it and act in it, what would you pick and who? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, Clark Gable in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, Edward. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, Blade Runner for a moment, if that's okay. Um, I had two questions. Number one, um, I'd heard that Harrison Ford thought that the shooting process on that film was quite unpleasant. And I was wondering if you felt the same way. No, just the opposite. I, I had probably one of the finest experiences I've ever had in filmmaking uh, to this day. Um, yeah, he had a hard time with it. Remember, he had worked with Lucas and Spielberg in the biggest films the world had ever seen. And he was probably, he was at that moment in time the largest box office um, hero, artist in the history of film. His movies had made more money than any other movies in the history of film. Each one made more than the one before. So for three consecutive years, the three consecutive motion pictures, his movies had gotten real. And then he got involved with Ridley. And Ridley had a different style. He was much more laid back, uh, did not push, and completely annihilated with his character. You have to remember it. In every single, go back and watch Blade Runner. Every single time he faced somebody, he got his ass kicked. <laughs> Even the women beat the shit out of him. <laughs> so you think that he was feeling good about making this movie? I don't think so. <laughs> Indy never got punched by a woman, did he? No, I mean, Indy never got hit by a woman, and, and I mean, if he did, he'd laugh about it and go, ha ha ha. But in this case, he got his ass kicked. Actually, I've just been given a correction. He did get hit by a woman. Yeah, she did. And, and she, he laughed about it. You know, it was no big deal. He couldn't do that in Blade Runner. So the second question was, um, can you actually make those little origami unicorns or not? <laughs> now, I never made the unicorn. I, I made the, the chicken, but then it was enhanced. And I made the stick man. Those two I did make. And then when I went to see the movie, I saw the unicorn. I had no idea the unicorn. No one knew that Decker was a replicant. No one. I don't know when really found out that he was. <laughs> All I know is that I got to the end of the movie and I said, holy shit. <laughs> but no, he's, hey, he was, he was a replicant. You know, and I mean, it, it, it was crazy. And, and of course, oh, Harrison, really hated the movie when he found out. It was just really hard for him. But now he's grown to, I think, to really appreciate it a lot. I think that he's realized that Star Wars, Star, you know, Raiders, and all these great films that he made don't stand and hold water as well as Blade Runner does. Blade Runner is arguably the best, if not the best, one of the best science fiction movies ever made in the history of the world. Hi there. Hello. So, uh, first of all, I'd say you are about to the heroes. Thank you so much for being here. My first question to you. When you landed the role of uh, William Adana at Star Galactica, um, what process did you go through to get into the mind of that character? You know, this probably was one of the most shocking experiences I've had. Because I didn't want to do, I, I was busy doing my work, and if you've seen any of my other work, you notice that I really don't do commercial kind of films. 
I never have. I did Blade Runner, but that really wasn't a commercial film. That was an artistic film, even when we were making it. We knew it from the get-go. But we also knew that it could be commercial because of the subject matter. But Stan and Deliver, a film that I made, American Me, another film that I made, uh, Selena, um, you know, My Family, really culturally diverse kind of films. And so when they asked me to do Battlestar, I was, I, I had never even seen the original. And the reason I hadn't seen it is because I was doing theater at the time. I was doing a play that rocked the United States of America, actually rocked the world. The theatrical world was, was actually moved to a new understanding level by a play called Zoot Suit. And I played a character called El Pachuco. And uh, it's been hailed as one of the three definitive characters ever to arise on the American stage in the history of American theater. Along with Stanley Kowalski, Willie Loman, is El Pachuco. Those are the three definitive characters ever to arise on the American stage. Not set by me, but set by the American <coughs> theater wing, which give out the Tonys and take care of uh, theater, archival theater in the United States. That being said, I had never, that took, I was doing that play in 1978. I did it for until 1981. So I didn't watch much television. We do theater, we do eight shows a week, and you have maybe Monday nights off. That's the only nights you have off the rest of the time you're working. Start at 5.30 in the afternoon, and you go until 11 o'clock at night, every night, six days a week. So I never watched Battles. But I'd heard about it, and uh, but I had not seen it. So when they offered me the opportunity to do Battle Star, I said thank you very much, but no thank you. I had been offered the opportunity to do Star Trek when Kirk was was uh, killed. They asked me to take over the next show and be the next uh, captain of the Enterprise. And I said thank you, but no thank you, because I was working on my own movies and my own things. Uh, I've turned down more things than I've actually accepted. I'm better known for the things that I've said no to <laughs> than I am for the things that I've done. Because most of you have not seen the things that I've done. And only because of the fact that they're films that don't quite reach the mass levels. But in time they do. Like Stand and Deliver. How many of you have seen Stand and Deliver? There you go. In the United States of America, Stand and Deliver story about a school teacher is the single most viewed film of any film ever made in the world in the United States of America. Why? Because tens of thousands of teachers use it every year and have for the last 30 years in their classrooms. Just like they use Catch in the Rye or they use great literature that every year that's in the 8th grade or the ninth grade or 10th grade you get a certain thing that you have to read in the history books. You have to understand certain things. Well, in schools across America, they have to see the stand and deliver. And so millions upon millions upon millions of kids have seen that movie every year. So over 30 years, not even gone to the wind could keep up with it. That being said, um, basically now with uh, the whole understanding of Battlestar, when I took on the responsibility it was only because someone in my office in my family said to me, read the first three pages. Oh, okay, I'll do that. So I read the first three pages. It wasn't the script. It was kind of like a, a way of looking at the way you were going to read the script and the way it was going to be done. It was a prologue, and it was the most extraordinary commitment that Ron Moore person who really imagined the remake of, of Battlestar had written on how to read and what was going to be happening with Battlestar. I read the first three pages and I couldn't stop. Brilliant piece of writing. And when I turned the page to page one and I started to read it and they started, I started to see the way it was written, I said, oh my God, this thing is incredible. So I, I had a meeting with Ron Moore, David Icke, and Michael uh, Reimer. And uh, we ended up meeting, and I just said one thing to them. I said, the first 
creature that I see coming from the Black Lagoon, some kind of monster in another planet, from another, you know, universe, and just comes into world, into our world, and it becomes like a two-mouth, four-eyed, three-eared creature. I'm going to faint on camera, and you're gonna have to write in. Commander Adama died of a heart attack. <laughs> and so I told I put that into my contract. No creatures from the black lagoon allowed. No, you know, jellyfish type things and weird things coming in. So that was the only thing, the only condition I said I, I really wanted to have the integrity of uh, Blake Runner. If it does not have the integrity of Blake Runner, I do not want to take any part of this because I don't like to be facing something that is a creature from, that looks weird and I'm going to fight it. And so I said, I, that isn't what I want to do. What I want to spend my time doing is trying to figure out who we are as human beings. And that's what I've been doing with all my work. And so they said, don't worry, Ed, that's why we asked for you. And I said, well, that's why I'm sitting here, because I read what you guys are doing. And it's just unbelievable. And from that moment on, history was bad. Because like I said, when I really started, I don't think that there's been, I know for me, there's never been a, a more extraordinary usage of television that I've ever been a part of. And I've been a part of a lot of shows that have been very, very good, including, uh, you know, West Wing and uh, NYPD Blue and uh, quite a few of the major pieces of work that have been done for television. So, whatever that is, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> Question, go ahead. One second, Kim Rose. Um, does it make you sad that um, with all the events that happened in Southern Europe today, that it shows that more relevant wasn't made about people not having a home, finding themselves at the cost of career for the best of I didn't catch all of that, you kind of. Uh, sorry, with uh, all the events happening in Southern Europe, does it make you sad that the show is even more relevant today? They lost when it was made. Yeah, it was back to the question that was asked just a little while ago. Why is it so, uh, you know, dark and why is it so uh, pessimistic in you know, using science fiction and why is it that way? Um, two things. One, I was kind of joking around, but it was kind of serious too. Um, we're into a very difficult time. I said, I might, I said it to somebody who was sitting there signing an autograph. I said, one of the most interesting things, if there was a holocaust, nuclear holocaust, on the planet, and you had seen the show, Battlestar Galactica, you would be able to try to understand how to live forward. But if you hadn't seen the show, the holocaust would wipe you out. If you lost every single person you know, and you were the only one left, you, and you hadn't seen the show, you'd probably commit suicide. Say, well, what am I going to live for? I don't have an earth, there's nothing to live for, I can't leave, I can't move on forward. But if you had seen that start like that, you might have a different perspective on what the responsibility is for us as human beings to go on and move forward. So to answer your question lightly, yeah, it's kind of depressing because uh, technology is getting to the point of where it can wipe us out and it has for a long time since the 50s actually but now even more so because uh, i really the biggest understanding that i have right now has been that we are building bases for receiving all the information big huge computers it's about five or six of them on the planet and we're connecting them. How far is it going to be? How long do we have to wait before they start talking to themselves without us? That's, you know, that's the question. When are they going to lock in one day and start to do work on their own without being programmed? Will they ever reach that level? I say they will. At that moment, since all of our nuclear situation is structured around using computers, inevitably, we are in for a little bit of a problem, especially when they start talking to each other. 
And that, in essence, is where we're going with, with our technology. So as far as I'm concerned, we have a lot to really try to understand in the future. Uh, I, for one, enjoy my technology, but I, for one, also realize that we are living under Big Brother now more than ever before. They know exactly what I say. They know what I do. And they, you say, oh, come on, man, are you that paranoid? No, I'm not. I just know what they're doing now. They, it's very simple for them to get every single person's usage of their equipment and program it into a computer. It's ones and zeros, and they just put them. That doesn't mean they're gonna come up to you and say, we were checking you out. No, because you're in an IP number. Unless you give them a reason, they're not going to go looking for you. But the day that you give them a reason, for whatever reason, that they might choose, the IRS, in my case, in the United States of America, they will have all the information on you. And they have it. It's just all pushed over there. And everything that I see on my laptop, everything I see on my telephone is recorded and kept. So that's a that's the world we live in today. Go ahead. I um I just started watching Batstrom like last month. And that was because I was watching major crimes with Mary. And um, my question is, JP Bamba has recently been on the show as a guest star, and I was wondering if you uh, if someone asked you to be a guest star on major crimes, would you say yes? Yes. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was so pissed off at them when they didn't invite me to be your husband, even though the guys, uh, would they get married or? Uh, we got some, I think it's Tom's Tom Barrett. It is, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would love to do a show with her. I'd love to do anything with her. The woman is phenomenal. Uh, she's been a very close and dear friend. And I must say that we, we relate a lot to each other. Matter of fact, the entire cast has been connected over the last eight years since we finished the show. And I'm uh, very proud of her. Matter of fact, Jamie uh, is staying and living with me at, uh, at my home in Los Angeles because he just moved to France with his family. So by moving to France, anytime he goes to the United, to the United States, in Los Angeles, he stays with me. Michael Hogan, who lives in Canada, whenever he comes into LA, he stays with me. Uh, James Callis, Baltar, he stayed like eight months with me until he bought a house about three blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty close. In. And, uh, you know, uh, Michael Trugo and uh, Sadie, Katie and Katie Sackhoff and uh, Trisha. And we get together a lot. And it's, it's a lot of fun. So they're the best friends I've, I have. And uh, the only friends that I've kept in respect of, uh, of the work that I've done in this business in the last 25 years. Next. Hi. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say thanks for coming out. It's great to see you. Um, I have a question sort of about when you were uh, starting to film Battle of Star Wars, we were going through. Um, when did you find out who the son, like, who was actually a Cylon? And if it was only sort of later on, did you have your suspicions before that point? When we started the show, we did not know anything about Cylons, you know, and then we found out about Cylons, and we started to read about them as the script started to materialize. Uh, we did not know that Boomer was a Cylon until the second episode, and we read the second script. So every script had its, its, you know, its information that was not let out to anybody, including us. But uh, I will say that towards when the, the final five, they were starting to talk about the final five, we all kind of got a little bit concerned. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, the one who got the most concerned was uh, the XO. Um, <laughs> the commander um, had a really hard time with Michael Hogue and the actor refused to accept it. <laughs> he was so pissed off. He did not want to be a Cylon, no matter what they said. He said, I'm sorry, man, I'm not a Cylon. I'm just not a Cylon. You're going to have to face the reality. I'm not. And so it took everything for them 
And so if you look at the program and you start to watch his character and the craziness that starts to happen to him, he manifested that. And it was all truth. He hated being a son. And then when he found out what it meant, he loved it. <laughs> he loved it. He became like, oh my God. When we killed Kate Vernon, his wife, Ellen, when we killed her, none of us knew that she was a son. She didn't know she was a son. She dies on the screen. <clears throat> she drinks the poison. She's dead. And we all cried when she left the show. Little did we know she'd be back like three or four episodes later as one of the, she's the mother of all the sons. And Hogan's character, you know, was the father. He was the man who created all the sons. So between both of them, they were the creators of the sons. And so when he found that out, well, she, he was happy to spend a lot of time. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Question. Thank you. Hi. Hey, Brian. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my question, as is kind of connected to the previous one, if you had learned that Bill was going to be a Cylon, would you have played the character any differently? I don't think you would. That was the whole idea. Same thing with the replicants. You know, they, they I mean, Harrison, when he, when he was pissed off about it, he said he didn't know. And, and uh, you know, Ridley said that you, you wouldn't have known. That was the whole idea. You really didn't know. And the ones that did know came back to haunt us. They wanted longer lives. And uh, that was their default. And, uh, and Batty and, and uh, all of them, the Leon and all of them, they came back for one reason. They wanted to live longer than four and a half years. And so uh, in the case of Cylons, you didn't really know. And then when you did find out, it was fantastic, you know, then you were, you could never die. <laughs> it was a nice world to live in. So uh, basically, uh, if I was to be known as, if I had found out that I was a son, uh, I would have been very happy, to be honest with you, because I would, that means I would have been helping humanity, you know, save itself. But, uh, and they did. It's one of the reasons we were invited to the UN. Did any of you see, uh, when they went to the UN. Anybody see the UN battle strike the United Nations? Do yourself a favor. Go online, YouTube, and put battle strike Galactic at the United Nations. The year is 2009. We are invited to participate in the only time that they've ever asked a television show to ever come in and speak to the entire planet at the United Nations. And it's mind-blowing. Three hours we sat there. Mary, myself, Ron Moore, David Icke. And, and the moderator was Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> and you say, oh my God, what a strange group. Yes. And there was, there was not one chair that was open. It was jam-packed. You should take a look at it. There was press from all over the world. And the reason that they came and the reason that they wanted us there is because we talked about certain things in the show that they, the UN, do every day and that they work with every day. And they found, by looking at the show, that they found themselves saying, yeah, that's the kind of work that we have to do. The number one job that they have to do is reconciliation. They're trying to reconcile the differences on the planet. The Jews, the Palestinians, you know, the unbelievable amount of strife and warfare that there is on this planet right now. The UN tries to bring about an understanding between the different nations, the warring nations, and try to find a way of reconciling their differences. Well, the biggest reconciliation that's ever been shown in the history of film has been between the Sahelans and the humans. They had to reconcile with one another in order for humanity and for the Cylons to be able to exist. And so that, with that, they would show seven to eight minutes of our program. And then what they would do is that the head of the executive director of that particular subject matter, reconciliation, would speak for about 20 minutes. And then they would open up to have anybody ask either us or the UN questions. 
So that's what happens. And if you want to do yourself a favor, you should definitely get up and watch that. It's, it's fine. We said some quite interesting things that changed the course of a lot of people's lives on the planet at that time in 2009. You'll see what I mean if you watch the show. If you watch it. Hello. Um, I think part of what makes our style work is that it's a show for deeply flawed characters, and I really love that about the show. But there is sort of one relationship that's always uh, seemed a bit strange to me, more so than the others. Could you um, give me some insight into why Admiral Adama has so much faith in his soul? Perhaps not unwarranted, but on paper, he is a very deeply disturbed man. Especially in the earlier seasons, he breaks down quite a lot. But I don't know, Adama is always there. Just yeah, they, you have to go back 40 years when they met when they were young kids and they were fighter pilots. And if you watch uh, uh, Blood and Girl, you start to learn about what life was like when I was 20 and Ty was a little younger than I was at the time. And if you go back to there, then you realize why the relationship was so strong that when you start the episodes that we, and when you started the, uh, the show, he's, he's an alcoholic, and he has been for a while. But I carried him with me because I really appreciated the years that he had devoted and what got him to be an alcoholic. He understood it. And so I, I took care of him. And we were, gonna be, we were a museum. It was over for us. Time left was it was over. We, we were being put out into into the world of traveling from planet to planet as a museum for children to come on board to see what life was like, you know, back in the old days, in the Battlestar days. And uh, so that's why I had such a strong understanding with him. And it turns out that uh, as he became to understand himself, I lost. Him. That was never written, but I brought that into play. Uh, I brought in the fact that where, where Adama went to, and when, when he became an alcoholic himself and used pills and was trying to escape the realities of what the world was like for him, uh, the, the writers of the show and the, the, the network were going, what the hell's going on? Because here's our hero, Adama, and he was on the ground throwing up and, you know, <laughs> bombed out of his mind. If, if you start to look, he's always drinking. You know, about halfway through the show, season three, he's like a strong alcoholic. By season four, forget it, man. The guy is just completely wiped out. He can't get, he can't put two words together. And and that, you know, like, I had never played a character that went that far, and that they allowed me to play. And then he comes back, and he leads the charge for to the end, and uh, so it was really a, a very strong uh, commitment to understanding the situation we were dealing with. And that situation, believe it or not, was highly praised by commanding officers in the military in the United States of America. I had more people, more admirals, more commanders, more generals relating to me and getting in touch with me to say thank you for allowing them to experience what they were going through that they couldn't allow anybody else to show to see. They felt like, whoa, I guess I'm not, you know, doing anything that I shouldn't be doing because it's, I can't imagine being a commanding officer and sending in 3,000 young men and women into battle when only 500 come back and feel that you can get up the next morning and say, well, that was pretty good. Let's say 500. And you lose, you lose 2,500 people, and they wipe you out, and you win the, the, the mountain. <laughs> it's just like, what are you talking about? But at the same time, when we showed it, they were so grateful, because no one had ever shown that. When you show that kind of descent, you usually mean to say that the guy burned out and died. He didn't come back. Name, try to figure out how many people have gone 
do that. Start off very strong, completely demoralized, completely lose all the self-respect, self-esteem, self-worth, and then hit the bottom of the skids, and then still, then are able to pick themselves up and elevate themselves and move on to the end with everybody going, yeah, you did it. <laughs> very seldom you ever see that. I've never, I've never seen it in the show. I didn't think they would let me do it. But I was directing. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the ones that are really bad, where he's like working on the bathroom, when he starts to clean his own bathroom, he's in his, his blue dress uniform, and he's re re redecorating his bathroom. And oh my God. They went nuts. And I'm ending up on the ground. I'm laying there. My, my son, Jamie, is going to be here tomorrow. And, and uh, he's, he's laying he's on the ground, he's holding my hand, and I'm completely throwing up. <laughs> Woo! Very emotional stuff. But uh, thank you for the question. Uh, hi. Actually, kind of follow up from that one about the relationship with Saul. Um, the other one has had like, many relationships with different characters, uh, Starbucks, Apollo, Chip itself. Which of those relationships was your favorite, either as the character or as an actor for trainers? You know, I'll have to say that the, the entire experience is my favorite. I don't think that there's a day that goes by that I don't recall something that I don't remember. As far as I'm concerned, it happened. And I was there. And I went through it. Just as much as many of you who have taken the experience and gone through it. So you've seen it four or five. How many people? I've seen it uh, three times, four, five, six, seven. Look at this. One young woman came up to me and she says, I saw the entire, all 88 hours in four days. <laughs> so if you, if you watch the Portlandia, <laughs> If you haven't seen Portland, you go online and watch that too. Just uh, YouTube it. But they go through the, you know, when people find it, and then they have all the elements there, and they have all the, the DVDs, and then they start to watch one hour of it, you know, one episode, and they go, wow, that's just one hour. <laughs> and then be like four hours later, they're <laughs> there. They, they can't go to the bathroom. And, you know, and, it's crazy. Some people, how many of you saw the show in eight days? That was the, the record. It was about three or four million years old. Seven. But that was the record. Eight days was the, the, the most, the quickest way they had done it. Yeah, that's a lot of hours of watching it every day, doing nothing else. Really. But four days, you figured out how long did she sleep? How much time did she give herself to eat? And did she ever stop watching it? No, you can't. But uh, anyway, to me the whole show was a blessing. And I saw it from the beginning to the end. I've seen it quite a few times. Anytime somebody hasn't seen it comes over, let me get to sit down. <laughs> Any reason I have to watch it, I'll watch it. And I gotta tell you, I just, I am very, very proud of the work that we did in it. But I'm really overwhelmed with the clarity of the characters. Starbucks, you know, everybody. Duella, you know. I can't, I can't even begin to tell you there wasn't a character in there that didn't become the truth in every perspective of it. Even if they only had a small role. You know, uh, all I can tell you is I'm very proud of the piece of work that we did. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I'm a huge fan of and agents of shoot. Um, I actually had a question about what you said before that you, when you did Battlestar Galactica, you didn't want um, monsters or aliens. Can I ask why you chose to do agents of shield? Um, what drew you to the world despite the fact that there are superheroes and monsters and aliens? It was the uh, uh, going into that world, the Marvel world, and what they offered me was to be the real she. I said, whoa, <laughs> okay. So I am the real she. And 
and that's why they had to get rid of that. Spoiler! <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I don't make it. <laughs> but uh, that was the reason, because I was the, the position that they asked me to play on the show was quite extraordinary, and they asked me to do this as a favor to them and to their those guys are incredible. They're writing the movies. You know, they're taking care of the franchise. And so it connects, the television was connected with the films. And I was always hoping that I'd make it to the films. <laughs> but uh, didn't work with them. I got myself. At first I was uh, uh, turned into stone. And then they blew the whole building up that I was in. <laughs> they got rid of all my DNA. <laughs> I'm not coming back. <laughs> Question. Hi, hello, how's it going? I'm Nathan, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. Uh, Blade Runner is one of my favourite films, and I kind of think everyone in that movie is in fact a replica of man. Uh, you still had memory implants in that movie? Did I have memories? Memory implants in that movie? Me memory, memory enhancement? That's the one, yeah. Wow. Uh, go ahead, go. Uh, I was the only Blade Runner in the movie. Right, yeah, so you were the uh, more or less trucking Deckard. Yeah, 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 taking care of him until I could get rid of him. Uh, that was, but he was the only one that could take care of the other guys, because he was an advanced model. So, <laughs> you know, in, in essence, that's what the, the, that's what I found out after I did the show, by the way. Like I said, I didn't know at the time that I, who I was, and neither did Deckard. So, uh, I mean, I, I knew that I was a blade runner, because I was, Guy taking him around and was part of the police department. But, but uh, no, I was not anything special other than that I came from Madama, who was on the earth 200,000 years before I was born. But <laughs> that was it. And uh, the finance played in the two over this year with Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling. I was just wondering if you know, in fact, any rumors of you being in the movie? If I'm going to be invited to be in the film? Yeah. I haven't been invited yet. I would not love to be invited. I'll tell you what, I'll start a Facebook fan page, alright? Go for it, man. Yeah. 